Now on BBC Radio 4, it's time for our afternoon play. A documentary film crew arrive at a coastal town to make a film about M.R. James, the ghost story writer. But they end up getting more than they bargained for. A Warning to the Furious by Robin Brooks. This is a programme about the life and works of Montague Rhodes James. Considered by the literary establishment to be the best writer of ghost stories ever produced by the Victorian age. Or, some would say, by any age. We're here on the bleak shore of the North Sea to find the man behind the stories. To walk across the landscapes that inspired him. To dig down into whatever dark well of a soul could produce from an outwardly comfortable life of utter respectability and rectitude, such fear and horror. We're going to look behind the mask, peer into the seething, writhing subconscious of Victorian masculinity, to dig down into the unknowable, um, unguessable... Karen. What? You already said dig down. Did I? Oh, mm. shit. Maybe we should have done all the squares. No, no, I want to keep it fresh. Sorry, are we still rolling? No! Cut! Let's start again. The place on the east coast, which the listener is asked to consider, is Aldborough. Marshes intersected by dikes to the south, recalling the early chapters of Great Expectations. Flat fields to the north, merging into heath. A long seafront and a street, behind that a spacious church of flint. It is not very different now from what I remember it to have been when I was a child. Where the hell are we going to park? Oh, in the church car park? It says no parking in the church car park. Can you believe that? An electric wheelchair in the middle of the road? Will you make your mind up, you geriatric imbecile? We'll just have to go on down to the front. What about all the kit? Oh, we don't mind. We're used to looking it about. I'll give you a hand. Oh, no, you don't. I need you to concentrate. Oh, sorry, guys. Down on the front, a little film crew disgorges from the people carrier. Bob, the cameraman. That looks like a nice pub. Karen, the presenter, producer, writer, director. Later, if at all. Her pretty young research assistant. Zara. Are you sure I can't help with that? And the sound man. No, 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 no. Guy. That's quite delicate, actually. Oh. 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 And uh, quite heavy. Oh, sorry. Zara. Coming. Uh, Guy, mate. What are we short of? Uh, I'm pretty sure we got everything. Oh, think of something. I want to do a cafe, Ricky. I need something to look forward to. Um, batteries, AAA? Yeah, that's it. Uh, right. Karen? Yeah? Uh, we need some AAA. Uh, I'm just going to down the high street. Um, I won't be two minutes. You'd better not. The church is large, immense for a little seaside town like this. The high nave stretches up and away into the shadows. Ready? OK. Uh, can we just get a bit of level? OK. M. R. James produced his first ghost story at the age of... 31. 31. Oh, hang he... on. Oh, what is it now? OK, rolling. M. R. James produced his first ghost story at the age of 31. He was a confirmed bachelor and lived and worked at King's College, Cambridge. He led an extraordinarily privileged, oh, sheltered sorry. existence and cut... What is it now? Sorry, I'm getting some sort of... I don't know, something's... Hang on. If you say, um, confirmed bachelor, it means he was gay, doesn't it? He probably was, wasn't he? But there's no evidence for that, is there? I mean, we don't know, do we? I mean, he kind of seems to have been neither, doesn't he? Nobody's neither. Are you ready, gentlemen? Can we get on? I mean, yeah, the stuff yeah, is working, isn't it? Yeah, two ticks. Oh, OK. Well, let's sort out my clothes, then. Right. It is cold, musty and dank. But the interior repays inspection. There are some oddities in the stonework and in the carvings of the pew ends. You look a bit peaky, mate. Mm. You okay? 
I think I'm still a bit car sick. Yeah, low blood sugar. <sighs> she hasn't really mastered manual gears, has she? <laughs> what you need is a bacon sign in, my son. <sighs> now, there's an excellent kiosk on the front, but no hot food. On the high street, we've got crunchies. Uh, it's too trendy, too small, and full of pillocks with laptops. <sighs> Freezing in here. Uh, then we've got a little place directly opposite, but that's just for trippers, I reckon, fish and chips and ice cream. Ugh. But down the end is Cathy's Cafe, with a smattering of locals and a lovely Cathy herself presiding, and she does a full English. So, I've told her to reserve as a table. Canon Albrecht scrapbook. That's set in a church. I don't think I've read that one. No, it's one of his best. It's the first one he wrote. Um, it's about a scholar, a Cambridge Don, on his holidays. The man's clearly based on James himself. Bachelor, professor, incredibly learned, and on his own. Right. And he's on a trip to France, and he comes across this local church where he stumbles on a priceless manuscript uh -huh. with a picture of a demon in it. And he takes it back to his hotel to gloat over it. And then he notices something lying on the table beside him. Uh, Karen? Yeah? Uh, we're getting a bit uh, peckish. Oh, poor you. We need to crack on, I'm afraid. Oh, right. What do you think? Dress? Jeans and top? Um, I think you look lovely in all of them. Skirt and jacket? Skirt and top? The stained glass is for the most part strikingly ugly mid-19th century work. Only the window of the Lady Chapel survives from a much earlier era, said to have been brought here from the ruined Cistercian Abbey at Sipton during or after the dissolution. But it is in a poor state of repair, and the figure it portrays is mostly drapery, with no recognisable face. I'd have a bandit for everyday mm. riding. You know, the new 1250. Rust bucket. Yeah, well, I'll keep it clean. Touring? Oh, BMW 1200 LT, obviously. Sundays, Sunday ride out. Jacket and dress? The jacket's nice. That 80s looks very trendy now. Is it from Stella? Monsieur Primark. No way. Mm -hmm. The bike you really love, the head turner, the performer. Ah, oh, now. Come on. CBR 600R. Yeah, Ducati GT 1000. No, you old fart. They are beautiful, beautiful. I'll look at one of those and it elevates my pulse. The jacket's Karen Millen. Oh, lovely. And the jeans are sexy. Aren't they? Now, where can I get changed? I don't want our little techies slobbering all over me. <laughs> They'll look the other way. Ooh, yeah, right. Guys? Yeah? We'll be in the car. Karen's going to get changed. Yeah, OK. So, interviews. Who have we got? There's an antiquarian bookshop. Hold this for me, would you? The guy who runs that should be good for something. Then there's local writer, John Cantor. Never heard of him. He's not an enthusiast, but he's prepared to talk about atmosphere, writing what here. What about Esther you know. Freud? She's more Wilberswick. Yeah. I'm not sure she'd be interested. But doesn't Anthony Horowitz live around here? Orford. It's a bit further south. Yeah. Oh, it's freezing in here. We're just pratting about. She doesn't have a script. It's all going to be improvised. Vox Pops Atmos. <laughs> We're never going to make it to Cambridge tomorrow. More hours, more money. Yeah, if they ever pay. <laughs> Bloody independence. Just check the viewfinder for me, would you? OK. Is this cabling shot? I thought we had this place to ourselves. You what? Well, by the altar, there's... Well, what, what, what's the problem? In the viewfinder, I thought... What? what? Nothing. I'm going to get some fresh air. Oop. Here come the boys. I told you. What are they doing? Guy's in a hurry. They're desperate for a fag and a quick leer. Too late. What do you think? Lovely. Well, let's see what it looks like on camera, if that chimpanzee can get it working. From the age of 31 in 18... 18... 93. From the age of 31 in 1893, and for the next 25 years, M. R. James wrote ghost stories, one each Christmas, and read them by the fireside to his friends and cronies in King's College. He would blow out all the candles except one, by which he read, performed even, his latest work. He was, by all accounts, an excellent mimic and amateur actor, and his readings may well have been exceedingly effective. But the question Can is... We stop what... a minute? And cut... I think it could be the acoustic in here. You're really not going to do anything until you get your bacon sandwich, are you? Is that I'm it? I'm sorry, I keep picking all something right, up. All right, all right. You win. We'll get some breakfast. Uh, 
I know a place. Uh, right, order for me. I'm going to find Jeremy. What do you want? A white egg omelette with rocket and spinach yeah. and just a, a half pint of water. Not cold water, room temperature, or yeah. a bit warmer. But not hot. OK. Jeremy? Yeah, hi. No, it's going really well. Atmosphere is fantastic. It's all coming together. Yeah. Look, have you had a chance to look at our little male menopause proposal? You can sit with us if you like, love. We won't bite. Uh, I've got to do a bit of work. Sorry. Suit yourself. So, uh, that's basically it. Bacon, mushrooms, black pudding, sausage... Uh, two sausage. Two sausage, tomato scrambled. Fried bread or toast? Uh, yes, please. OK. Uh, just a coffee for me, please. Cappuccino? Just a coffee, please. You should eat something. Ah, OK. All right. OK. What? What? I had something in the church. I kept hearing something on the cans. What? Someone was laughing. Someone up in the tower, it sounded like. Oh, well, playing back. I did. There was nothing there. I didn't hear anything. I heard it twice. Oh, well, something from a previous recording. It's a brand new dat. Oh, well, you mixed them up. Yeah, I suppose so. The Treasure of Abbot Thomas, that's a good one for us. No, I haven't read that one. Well, there's this middle-aged antiquary. They're always antiquarians, always male, always single, always poking their noses into something. Men have to poke about it in their nature. That's what men do, they poke. So, this guy stumbles on the clue to a buried treasure, and he ends up climbing down a well in an old monastery. Mm -hmm. Opens up a chamber in the side wall of the well, although he's been warned the treasure has a guardian. Mm. And he sees some round objects that look like bags. Here. We have no rockets. I'm sorry. Oh, never mind. So, he reaches into this hole. Here it is. And my fingers touched something curved. I've put on extra spinach. Yeah, OK, thank you. Something curved that felt, yes, more or less like leather. Dampish it was, and evidently part of a heavy, full thing. I pulled it to me. It was heavy, but moved more easily than I expected. I went on pulling out the great bag in complete darkness. It hung for an instant on the edge of the hole, then slipped forward onto my chest and put its arms around my neck. So the bachelor is terrified of something down a damp hole. Excuse me, this is the water. I let the kettle boil and just left it. So it's not cold. I hope it's not too hot. Right. Everything all right? Yes, thank you. Oh, it is too hot. And then there's casting the runes. The hero puts his hand under his pillow, fills a mouth with teeth and with hair about it. I wonder what it can all possibly mean. <laughs> I don't think Dr. Freud would have too much trouble in diagnosing Mr. James then. <laughs> exactly. He was terrified of women. Exactly. Here you are. Fantastic. Do you want extra toast? Do bears go to the bathroom amongst the trees? Sorry, yes, please. OK. So James goes to a single-sex boarding school, and then he goes straight to King's College. Yeah. Which is a single-sex college. Was then. They let women in in 1972. Bigger than them. And he stays there for the rest of his life. Until he goes back to Eton as provost. So basically, he lives the life of a monk, and he never comes out of the cloister. So he knows nothing about women. So he fears them. Because what you don't know, you are automatically afraid of. And what you fear, you hate. Where did you read that? Men's Health magazine. And what are we supposed to do about it? Wear loose on the keks, moderate your alcohol intake. I've done my bit for reproduction, thank you very much. I thought you didn't want kids anyway. I thought that's why you and Jane split up. Mm, true. So why are you worrying about it? Mm. This is top brecky. If I'm going to have another day with these two, I'm going to need meals like this to keep me going. I wouldn't kick Zara out of bed. Right. If Chas and Dave have finished cultivating their beer bellies, let's get on with it. What's next? Um, Fox Pops. Excuse me? Excuse me? Um, have you heard of M.R. James, the ghost story writer? No. no. <laughs> he, he, uh, he, he wrote stories uh, based in Albrough? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not even from England, so I probably wouldn't have heard of him. You are definitely at a disadvantage, then. Enjoy. Okay. Excuse me. I'm sorry to bother you. Have you heard of M.R. James, the ghost story writer? No. No. OK, thank you very much for your time. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Have you heard of M.R. James, the ghost story writer? Um, did he used to live round here, didn't he? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Well, I'm sorry cut. I couldn't be a little no, more cut, helpful. Cut, cut, cut. Let's. Excuse me. Um, 
Have you heard of M.R. James, the ghost story writer? Uh, no. And cut. Have you ever heard of M.R. James? M.R. James, I have, yes. He wrote ghost stories. Oh, not that M.R. James, no. Have you heard of M.R. James, the ghost story writer? I'm afraid we're Anthony Horovitch and Richard Scarry. Oh, so yes. <laughs> Both <laughs> very good choices. Never mind, thank <laughs> you for your time. Cut. That's quite enough of this for now. If you say so. Let's go down to the sea and get some atmos. Walk away from the town, southwards, along the sea's edge, and there is nothing but shingle for a long way. Not a house, not a human creature, just a long spit of land, with the river on the right and the sea on the left. Only, a long way down the shore, there is an old Martello Tower, close to the sea, and beyond it, just the shoreline, stretching away to Orford Ness. It's in A Warning to the Curious. I haven't read that one. It's a bit far-fetched. The man stumbles across a mound, and inside it he finds one of the three fabled crowns of the ancient kings of East Anglia. But the crown has a guardian, a terrifying presence. Just like the treasure down the well. He's not afraid of repeating himself. I think he came back to these themes because he couldn't help it. He didn't think about it much. It just all came out. And put its clammy arms around his neck. <sighs> So what happens to the crown person? Well, he's tricked onto the shingle in the fog by something. He thinks he's running off to his friends, then he comes around the side of the tower and he meets the thing he was most afraid of. Come along, gentlemen. Yeah, all right. What about the tower? Is it open? Uh, it looks a bit private. Let's get closer. It's only a bit of old barbed wire. You can see we got lost. Mind your skirt. And I'll go under. It's all right, there's no one around. Excuse me. Christ, where did he spring from? Excuse me, this is private. Sorry. Sorry, we got a bit lost. Well, there's the footpath. It's on the other side of that fence you just climbed over. I'm sorry. We're a film crew. We're making a documentary. Uh? It's about M.R. James. The, the ghost story writer? Sorry. You'd be better off on the other side of the fence. OK, OK. Sorry. Can I hold the wire for you? No, I can manage. Thank you. Keep to the path, won't you? What was all that about? Pomp and git. Let's go down to the beach. That's not private, I suppose. Beside the squat tower, its outworks crumbling into the sea, there is little to be seen. The town on the horizon, the enormous sky, the estuary behind, the wide sweep of sea dead in front. Yet in all this, for those who can feel it, an acute, an acrid consciousness of a restrained hostility, very near. OK, let's set up. I'll stand here. Uh, just give us a minute. Now, where's that quote? The one about him being a child? Benson, uh, his friend. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I want to use that. Just stand where you are for a moment. Uh, is, uh, is that about right? Whatever. Uh, Guy, where are you going to be? Uh, just here. Right. Here it is. There. Talked with profound admiration of MRJ and his mind, his immense and accurate memory for details. He is very humorous, too. But after that, his mind is the mind of a nice child. He hates and fears all problems, all speculation, all originality or novelty of view. His spirit is both timid and unadventurous. He is much abler than I am, yet I feel that he is a kind of child. I'm just going to have to wait for someone to move, uh, then we can get started. What? There's somebody way off behind that tower. Is that bloke just now? No, no, it's someone much, much thinner. Oh, yeah, let's use this. This is great. This is the frustrated, neurotic bachelor, the, the repressed yeah. homosexual, uh -huh. all screwed up, and out it comes in the stories. He's waving. Where? Fear of women, fear of the other. It's obvious. Right. Mm -hmm. There he is. He's sort of... What's he doing? Beckoning. I can't see anyone. OK, boys, you ready? Have a look through the viewfinder. How do you zoom in with this thing? Here, there, there boys. you go. Boys? Guy? What is it? Are you ready? Guy? You all right? What's going on? Uh, just a minute. Oh, for God's sake. It's in the viewfinder. You look. No, I caught a glimpse. I don't want to look now. It's gone now. I saw it. Close. Did you see it? It's not there look now. Look through the viewfinder. Uh, no. Let's turn around. Shoot towards the town. 
We'll, we'll say it's the light. I don't want to hang around here. There's nothing there now. Come on. Let's get this over with. Someone's just playing a trick on us, that's all. I don't want him hammered all afternoon. Yeah, just one drink. Bob says he's had a bit of a shock. What shock? Off the equipment or something? Will you make it clear? One drink only. OK, I'm going to check out the bookshop. I'll see you in lunches or whatever it's called. OK. Do you want a drink? No, I'm fine. Guy, here's your brandy. Cheers. Is everything OK? We'll get an hour for lunch. Yeah, I'm sure. A that's... full hour. Yeah, that's fine. Fine. I'll get a table. We'll be in bunches, Karen and I, OK? Sorry about that. Is everything all right? I'm getting a lot of aggression off Bob. Uh, he's had uh, a few domestic problems in that, yeah. Is there anything I can do? Do you know... What? Is someone mocking us about? What? What do you mean? Nothing. Forget it. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Anyone here? Could I have some help, please? Sorry. <gasps> you gave me a shock. Most people like to browse. It's you, Mr. Martello. Mrs. Trespass. Muz. I think the first collection is here somewhere, if you're interested. Sorry? Emma James. You are looking for a copy. Oh, my assistant has all that. It's a first edition. Quite rare. It has the illustrations by McBride. Fascinating story, that. What? What? What, what story? Are you interested in the book? Well, let's see, then. Unless I am very much mistaken. So you do know about him? Here. His first published volume, Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, 1904, with McBride's illustrations. See? Canon Albrecht's scrapbook. The first story. And here's McBride's picture. Hmm, yeah. There's the unwitting scholar, sitting at the table in his lodging, poring over the book he's just acquired. Would you like to sit down? Uh, no, thank you. And just beside him in the shadows, you can make out the dim, lurking shape of the demon. So what's the story? About the demon. About McBride. McBride. He died. Is that it? He was a close friend. Very close. Perhaps the closest James ever had. There are some who say it was McBride's friendship that inspired James to write. He left a young wife and daughter. James looked after them. McBride never completed the illustrations for the volume. A great pity. He was only an amateur artist, but no one has bettered his illustrations of James's work. The feeling he put into them. So what happened to him? Do you want the book? How much is it? The price is inside. £475? You must be joking. It's very rare. Very rare and unusual. There is a strange erratum on page 139, corrected in later editions. It's on the penultimate page of A Warning to the Curious. Really? You know the story, of course? I, um, may I see? Do you wish to buy... No. To the north of the town, a broad path runs away through a strip of rough grass along the top of the shore. The view is bleak. The sea is slate gray. The pale sand is intersected at irregular intervals by black wooden groins, standing up stark against an afternoon light that is yellowing and will soon begin to fade. This poor boy was followed and at last pursued and overtaken and either torn in pieces or made away with by a horrible hopping creature in white. Nice. And sometimes it just seems to be random, like in Count Magnus when the researcher's just wandering past a church and happens to look in. I haven't read that one. Sometimes they kind of deserve what they get from being nosy, but they always get more than they bargain for. Uh -huh. Yeah, the evil they disturb is way out of proportion. Right. In O Whistle and I'll Come To You, My Lad, it's an accident. The horror comes to him for no reason. They're being punished for something they don't seem to deserve. It's like 
revenge or something. Good. That is good. Let's do something on that. Boys! We're ready. That makes a change. In Count Magnus, the thing that pursues him is so appalling. I mean, it's the most horrible Shit. image. What is it now? Guy, it's all right. It's just a person. It's all right. Just an ordinary person. It's all right, mate. You're just a bit spooked, that's all. Is something the matter? Uh, someone in shot standing behind the groin. I, I think he's just watching. <sighs> The problem is, nothing happens here, and so you turn up with a camera and they think it's a little bit of glamour in their humdrum lives. <laughs> and then it's, oh, can I watch? And then, my daughter wants to be a filmmaker, she's ever so talented. Do you need a runner? <laughs> Zara, uh, tell whoever it is to go bugger off. It's the bloke from the Martello Tower. What's he doing? Stalking us? Bookshop man. <laughs> Maybe he fancies you. He's a creep. Get rid of him. OK. Hi. Hello. Can I help you? I was just watching. Not in the way, am I? Oh, I'm afraid you are. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I do find it all interesting. I was wondering what your colleague was saying. Well, you'll have to watch the programme when it goes out. Are you the writer? I'm responsible for content. Ah. Yeah, there isn't a script as such. Karen talks off the cuff, makes it more intimate, more direct. So where can I stand? Oh, I'm sorry. There's not really anywhere that would be really convenient. Don't mind this is going to sound like an appalling, unreconstructed male nonsense, but I must confess, it is slightly surprising to find a beautiful young woman like you interested in such a dry and dusty subject. Oh, well, thanks. I am, though. <laughs> interested, I mean. I tell you frankly, I am charmed. Lovely. Anyway, You see, I... the thing is, I am related to James. Pardon? I am his great-nephew. You're kidding! No, I keep quiet about it most of the time. I didn't mention it to your colleague, but... That's incredible! It's always been the biggest thing in my life. I was brought up on it, and then I've lived here, where the family come from originally, you know. Yeah. I suppose I'm a bit funny about it. The family is not much talked about locally. Oh, you must come and talk to Karen. We could do an interview. On camera? Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't mind talking to you, but... Oh, please. I don't have time now. I should go. I don't want to get... No, 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 really, no. Look, I tell you what. I'd better go. Come and have a drink with us this evening. There's a pub next to our hotel, just behind the meat hall. The Mill Inn. Just a drink. About, say, eight. Here's my card. It's got my uh, mobile number on it. Please say you'll come, please. Very well. Karen, you're not going to believe this. The quaint... Ancient Moot Hall was once the centre of the town, but the slow erosion of the coast has brought it closer and closer to the shore. Until now, it sits almost on the shingle, and the sign of the White Lion Hotel swings in a wind that blows straight off the sea. Karen's in the Wentworth. She needs to be there because it's got broadband, but I think you'd be very comfortable here. This is where the characters from A Warning to the Curious stayed. Mm. In the story, James called it the bear, but it was the white line he meant. Right. That's really interesting, Zara. Hello, everyone. Hi, Karen. Hi. Oh, yeah. Zara, here's some cash. You get the boys what they want. It's been a long day. Thanks very much. Oh, that's really sweet. Cheers. Uh, mine's a pint of beer. Yeah, me too. Okay. Then maybe we could all get a pizza. Lovely. Jeez. Zara, go ahead. Did you see that? What, five pounds? Yeah, barely around. Time, bitch. I'll get the boys set up and then we can go next door. I think I'd better handle our interviewee on my own, to begin with. Don't you want me to be there? Not at first. I need to, to build up a rapport. Then, of course, I'll need your expertise. OK. I need to flutter my eyelashes a bit. You know, do a bit of coaxing one-on-one. -on -one. The sun is down behind the town, and the clouds turn blood red, then purple, then black. So, Mr. Bookshop. Ms. Trespass. Apparently you're related to James. Yes, on my mother's side. He was my great-great-uncle. Can you prove it? <clears throat> James had two brothers and a sister. The oldest brother, Sidney, was born in Oldborough, actually, in 1855. He became headmaster of Malvern School and married in 1897. He had five children. I wanted His to second do daughter, Grace, was my maternal grandmother. James, of course, had no children. Of course. My mother inherited some very interesting effects, papers and so on. 
I could show you. Like? There was an odd little manuscript in Latin. Of course, my mother couldn't read it, but I could. Would you like a drink? You drank that quickly, Bob. Can I get you another? Uh, if you insist. My eldest got his saxophone exam tomorrow. I'm just going to try and wish him luck. Uh, I'll just... Uh, OK. I won't be there. Bitter, wasn't it, for Bob? Adnams. What do you want? What have you got? <laughs> there are lamps on the front. But their orange glow does not reach far out. And beyond them, the sea is fading until it is just a restless sound out in the darkness. So the James family lived here? I like Aldborough. I like it at this time of year. Freezing, deserted. And you live here on your own? You think I am a confirmed bachelor? Like my illustrious forebear? Far from it. I am in fact a widower. I lost my wife some time ago. Oh, I'm sorry. What was it? Was it breast cancer? What? Your wife. No. What is it? Sort of like the silver ring thing? Sort of. Isn't that a bit lonely? I have a lot of support from the group. It's very empowering. You feel free. Well, as free as you can be in the capitalist system, but... But don't you miss, you know, sex? Well, I did it so much. Right. Mm, everyone was doing it. It kind of mm. lost its buzz, you know? Right. And then all those men who didn't phone back or cheated or just treated you badly. It's payback time, right? I can lead them on, play games, and they can't touch me. <laughs> right. Of course, if the right man came along. Oh, Bob doesn't look very happy. Oh, this is dark as hell out there. Is everything all right? Yeah, she wouldn't let me speak to him. That's your pint, Bob. Oh, cheers. I'd like to interview you. Would you? On camera. Isn't it a bit dark? <laughs> I didn't mean right now. Maybe tomorrow? I'm staying at the Wentworth. We could talk about it over dinner if you like. Very well. I'll get my assistant to book us a table somewhere. Somewhere nice. Bob, Guy. Yeah. Karen's just texted me. She's gone to change. She's going to have supper with bookshop man. She said I should take you both out for a pizza somewhere. OK. OK. I'm just going to the ladies. You could be in there. Not so fast. She joined a chastity group. She's waiting for the right man. Oh, bless. Mm. Uh, tell you what. I think I'll stay in the bar. Give you a clear field. What do you reckon? If you like. Goo on my son. Um, yeah, I'll have to say. Right, thank you. No, where were we? Oh, yeah, part of the problem is the men I date. Mm. They're all too nice, just too nice. And then it's hard because I'm, I'm doing really well and it's hard to find someone who's as well ahead as me and even earning as much money. And if they don't earn as much money as you, then they just don't like it. Men can't bear well, to be out I don't think like that's that. all. But of course, true. if the right one came along. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. But yeah. it must be someone who's a good listener. You know, most men just spend half the time staring at you. Well, I, I you're a good do listener. That. Thanks. I'm anyway, the thing is, I've got a lot of strings to my bow. I'll be getting an assistant director credit on this one. Right. Good. But I really want to write. Mm -hmm. I've got this children's novel I've been wanting to write. I've got the idea for it. I just haven't had the time. Mm -hmm. It's about this girl who's exceptional, but she's in a world that's like not understanding. It's a bit like um, Pan's Labyrinth, but yeah. more entertaining. It'd make a fantastic film, actually. Yeah. I think to be a writer. You have to be fantastically sensitive. You know, you have to be open to other people. You have to be extraordinarily sensitive. And mm. I'm like that, I think. Zara, in the church and then on the beach, Yeah. I think I saw, I mean, I felt, I felt uncomfortable. Did you feel anything? God, yeah, it was bloody freezing, wasn't it? So sorry. Am I late? Not really. <sighs> and I'm paying. The company will pay. It's all on the budget for the documentary. So this documentary, I take it it's not a hagiography. It's it's not a it's a 
He was a misogynist, and we're going to out him, okay? <laughs> on the evidence of his life, you have nothing to go on. You might find a passage in the letters being rude about the tiresome wife of a colleague, or something like that. But you'll also find places where he expresses admiration for the fair sex, says he is charmed, and so on. Yeah, yes, but in the stories... The women in the stories don't conform to any glib interpretation. <laughs> Characters, male and female, are not much developed. Suggested, rather. But that is his great skill. Mrs. Anstruther in the Rose Garden. I haven't read that one. She is a strong woman. Uh -huh. Wears the trousers. Right. Organizes her husband. But then... She does get a very nasty shock. Or poor Anne Clark in Martin's clothes. Ah, yeah. She is a hapless victim, innocent to begin with, though perhaps less so after death. James doesn't see it the way you see it. He is a non-combatant in the battle of the sexes. Oh. The violence, the evil is handed out impartially. He is not engaged in the noisy assertion of his rights. He removed himself from the battlefield. That sounds like balls to me. I don't think you know much about it. There are things... What, things that you know and I don't? Things no one knows. Like what? <laughs> this is just a wind-up. Hmm? Mysterious hints that you've been dropping? No. There is something. What? A family secret. What? I could tell you, but not for your film. Off the record, then? You must promise. Okay. But if you change your mind... No. You'll see why. Go on, then. Tell me. A moon has come up, riding the clouds out over the sea. A bright, thin rind of a moon, now casting its cold light down across the water. Now extinguished by the hurrying clouds, now shining out again. Guy, you're in room 12. Oh, that's just next to me. Okay. Bob, you're in 37. It has a sea view. Has it got a telly? Oh, they all have, I'm sure. A satellite. Hi, everyone. Karen, how'd you get on? Gold mine. Gold crypt, I should say. What? He told me. Big secret. M.R. James isn't buried at Eton. Everyone thinks it's a grave, but it isn't. It's a memorial. He wanted to be buried in Alborough in the family vault, but they couldn't get official permission, so they kept it secret. Why couldn't they get permission? Because the vault is in ground no longer consecrated. The church went into the sea at the end of the 19th century. Oh, this church is... There's hardly anything of the graveyard left. One day it'll all go. Where's this vault? It's by the Martello Tower, but he won't let us film it. There's definitely something dodgy about him. He got very cagey about his dead wife. I wouldn't be surprised if he'd done away with her. <gasps> really? But he's agreed to meet us down there and show us. Now? Mm-hmm. So we're going to show up with the camera. Now? What's the matter, girl? You scared of the dark? Bob, uh, I'm not scared. Zara? OK. Away from the town, it is darker, colder. The tower is a squat silhouette against the moonlit clouds. Bob? Yeah? Is there enough light for you? When the moon's out, yeah, plenty. Good. I've got a torch. I don't need it. There's a light on the camera. I thought you said... Good. We're just here because we don't look scared in front of them. If you like. But what we saw, they haven't seen it. I didn't see anything properly. You did! It's just an interview. I don't want to go down so there. So who is this guy we're going to film who doesn't want to be filmed? While on the beach, he lives in the Martello Tower. Why did Sarah call him Bookshop Man, then? He runs the Antiquarian Bookshop. That's where Karen met him, right? She was browsing in the bookshop. Bookshop's closed. Yeah, it's midnight. No, shut down. What do you mean? For the winter. Uh, I heard them talking about it in the pub. It's been shut since September. Karen? Sarah! He's here. Bob, you ready? Karen! Karen! In the inky shadow of the tower beyond the barbed wire is a dip in the ground, a shallow trough. At the end of it, a small arched opening, half choked by sand and shingle. Above the trough stands a figure. Bob, are you rolling? Yeah. You said 
No camera. So what have you got down there? Are you willing to tell us? You shouldn't go in there. If you have nothing to hide, then why can't we look? I'm warning you. How long has this opening been exposed? Was it the storms? Is it recent? Did it come as a nasty surprise? You really don't know what you're talking about. But if you want to go in there, I can't stop you. You'll have to follow me. There are steps. Come if you must. And cut. Bob? I'm not going in there. Oh, come on. No. Oh, all right, little boys. We'll check it out. And if it's safe, you can come on in, OK? Zara? OK. Shit. You want to go in? No. Me neither. We didn't ask about the bookshop. I'm just going to check the footage. OK. Is it OK? She's in shot. You can't see him. Too dark. It kind of looks like he's not there. Check the light. Check the tape. Okay. He hasn't picked him up. I heard him on the headphones. Oh, this is a wind-up. It's got to be. Now listen. Bob, are you rolling? Yeah. So what have you got down there? Are you willing to tell us? If you have nothing to hide, then why can't we look? How long has this opening been exposed? Was it the storms? Is it recent? Did it come as a nasty surprise? Oh, shit. Shit, 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 shit. What are we going to do? Get out of here. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, shit, come on. Oh, we can't just leave them. Come on. There's something moving. There's something coming out. Oh, shit. Karen? Yes? Zara? Yeah? Are you all right? We heard a... What well, sounded Where like... Is he? he? He didn't come out on the tape. Don't worry about that. But where is he? No, no, don't worry. I've decided not to go any further with this project. What? Let's go. Now, don't worry, I'll... Uh... I'll pay you the full two days. We'll uh, we'll give you cash. Have we got enough cash? Um, yeah, no problem. And, and a little bit extra for the inconvenience. But, but what happened? Do you um, want to hand us any of that? No. Uh, no, fine, thanks. What the? What's going on? What, what's happened? Zara. Yeah. Have you still got your copy of the stories? Yes, uh, at the hotel. I think I should read them. Okay. Zara? Yeah? Can I sleep in your room tonight? Okay, thanks. I'll just get my stuff. Zara? Yeah? W what's your room number? It's, uh... It's number 13. In A Warning to the Furious by Robin Brooks. Karen was played by Lucy Robinson. Zara by Catherine Shepard. Guy by Carl Prekop. And Bob by Gerrit McDermott. A Warning to the Furious was directed and produced by Fiona McAlpine on location in Aldborough and was an Allegra production for BBC Radio 4. Oh, and I was Bookshop Man, and my name is Andrew Wincott. Everything? Oh, think of something. I want to do a cafe, Ricky. I need something to look forward to. Um, batteries, AAA? Yeah, that's it. Uh, Karen? Yeah? Uh, we need some AAA. Uh, I'm just going to down the high street. Um, I won't be two minutes. You'd better not. The church is large, 
immense for a little seaside town like this. The high nave stretches up and away into the shadows. Ready? Okay. Uh, can we just get a bit of level? Okay. M. R. James produced his first ghost story at the age of thirty-one. Thirty-one. Oh, hang he. On. Oh, what is it now? Okay, rolling. M. R. James produced his first ghost story at the age of thirty-one. He was a confirmed bachelor and lived and worked at King's College, Cambridge. He led an extraordinarily privileged, oh, sheltered sorry. existence and cut. What is it now? Sorry, I'm getting some sort of. I don't know. Something's. Hang on. If you say a um, confirmed bachelor, it means he was gay, doesn't it? He probably was, wasn't he? But there's no evidence for that, is there? I mean, we don't know, do we? I mean, he kind of seems to have been neither, doesn't he? Nobody's neither. Are you ready, gentlemen? Can we get on? I mean, yeah, the stuff yeah, is working, isn't worry, it? Yeah. yeah, two ticks. Oh, OK, well, let's sort out my clothes and... Right. It is cold, musty and dank. But the interior repays inspection. There are some oddities in the stonework and in the carvings of the pew ends. You look a bit peaky, mate. Mm. You okay? I think I'm still a bit car sick. Yeah, low blood sugar. <sighs> she hasn't really mastered manual gears, has she? <laughs> what you need is a bait and sign in, my son. <sighs> now, there's an excellent kiosk on the front, but no hot food. On the high street, we've got crunchies. Uh, it's too trendy, too small, and full of pillocks with laptops. <sighs> Freezing in here. Uh, then we've got a little place directly opposite, but that's just for trippers, I reckon. Fish and chips and ice cream. Ugh. But down the end is Cathy's Cafe, with a smattering of locals and a lovely Cathy herself presiding, and she does a full English. So I've told her to reserve as a table. Canon Albrecht scrapbook. That's set in a church. I don't think I've read that one. No, it's one of his best. It's the first one he wrote. Um, it's about a scholar, a Cambridge Don, on his holidays. The man's clearly based on James himself. Bachelor, professor, incredibly learned, and on his own. Right. And he's on a trip to France, and he comes across this local church where he stumbles on a priceless manuscript uh -huh. with a picture of a demon in it. And he takes it back to his hotel to gloat over it. And then he notices something lying on the table beside him. Uh, Karen? Yeah? Uh, we're getting a bit uh, peckish. Oh, poor you. We need to crack on, I'm afraid. Oh, right. What do you think? Dress? Jeans and top? Um, I think you look lovely in all of them. Skirt and jacket? Skirt and top? Now on BBC Radio 4, it's time for our afternoon play. A documentary film crew arrive at a coastal town to make a film about M.R. James, the ghost story writer. But they end up getting more than they bargained for. A Warning to the Furious by Robin Brooks. This is a program about the life and works of Montague Rhodes James. Considered by the literary establishment to be the best writer of ghost stories ever produced by the Victorian age. Or, some would say, by any age. We're here on the bleak shore of the North Sea to find the man behind the stories. To walk across the landscapes that inspired him. To dig down into whatever dark well of a soul could produce from an outwardly comfortable life of utter respectability and rectitude, such fear and horror. We're going to look behind the mask, peer into the seething, writhing subconscious of Victorian masculinity, to dig down into the unknowable, um, unguessable. Karen, what? You already said dig down. Did I? Oh, oh shit. Maybe we should do more of a script. No, no, I want to keep it fresh. Sorry, are we still rolling? No, cut. Let's start again. The place on the East Coast, which the listener is asked to consider... Pop? The stained glass is for the most part strikingly ugly mid-19th century work. Only the window of the Lady Chapel survives from a much earlier era, said to have been brought here from the ruined Cistercian Abbey at Sipton during or after the dissolution. But it is in a poor state of repair and the figure it portrays is mostly drapery with no recognizable face. I'd have a bandit for everyday mm. riding. You know, the new 1250. Rust bucket. Yeah, well, I'd keep it clean. 
Touring? Oh, BMW 1200LT, obviously. Sundays, Sunday ride out. Jacket and dress? The jacket's nice. That 80s looks very trendy now. Is it from Stella? Monsieur Primark. No way. Mm -hmm. The bike you really love, the head turner, the performer. Ah, oh, now. Come on. CBR 600R. Yeah, Ducati GT 1000. No, you old fart. They are beautiful, beautiful. I'll look at one of those and it elevates my pulse. The jacket's Karen Millen. Oh, lovely. And the jeans are sexy. Aren't they? Now, where can I get changed? I don't want our little techies slobbering all over me. <laughs> They'll look the other way. Ooh, yeah, right. Guys? Yeah? We'll be in the car. Karen's gonna get changed. Yeah, okay. So, interviews. Who have we got? There's an antiquarian bookshop. Hold this for me, would you? The guy who runs that should be good for something. Then there's local right. Is Aldborough. Marshes intersected by dikes to the south, recalling the early chapters of Great Expectations. Flat fields to the north, merging into heath. A long seafront and a street. Behind that, a spacious church of flint. It is not very different now from what I remember it to have been when I was a child. Where the hell are we going to park? Uh, in the church car park? It says no parking in the church car park. Can you believe that? An electric wheelchair in the middle of the road? Will you make your mind up, you geriatric imbecile? We'll just have to go on down to the front. What about all the kit? Oh, we don't mind. We're used to looking it about. I'll give you a hand. Oh, no, you don't. I need you to concentrate. Oh, sorry, guys. Down on the front, a little film crew disgorges from the people carrier. Bob, the cameraman. That looks like a nice pub. Karen, the presenter, producer, writer, director. Later, if at all. Her pretty young research assistant. Zara. Are you sure I can't help with that? And the sound man. No, 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 no. Guy. That's quite delicate, actually. Oh. Oh. Oops. And uh, quite heavy. Oh, sorry. Zara. Coming. Guy, mate. What are we short of? Uh, I'm pretty sure we got.